Start, yeah. We start. Oh, this is just done. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Sayyidina wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. The topic today is Islam and science and the relationship they have with one another. Uh, when we were planning this, um, this lecture, and I, I was thinking carefully about how to structure it, and one of the things that became apparent to me is that the people have different understandings when we say this. Some people, unfortunately now, they think Islam is science, and they have to prove it through a scientific method in order to in order for it to be correct. So what does Islam and science mean? Some people actually think that it's Islam which is not compatible with science, so they're two separate things, they're two separate entities. And today what we're going to look at is look at the relationship between Islam and science. But before we look at that relationship, it's obviously very important to understand what Islam is, what it wants from us, and what are the objectives and how can we understand uh, what true Islam actually is. And then the same thing applies to science. So what is science? So what is the definition of science? What are the objectives of science? Once we've got that, then we'll have a good foundation to build upon and then we will understand exactly what that relationship is. So, uh, starting off with Islam, what is Islam? Anybody got any ideas? How would you define Islam? We're all Muslim here, yeah? What is Islam? No definition? Yeah? Submitting to the will of Allah peacefully. Submitting to the will of Allah peacefully. Okay. Uh, okay, so this submission to the will of Allah peacefully, what does it consist of? How would you, how would you define that? What are... Tawheed. Huh? Tawheed. Tawheed. Anything else? <coughs> so obeying Allah. And being obedient to him. But what does that mean though? As in Okay, so when I was thinking about it, I've I've gone with very similar um with a very similar approach. But what I actually thought, and you will find this within the books of the scholars also, for example Akhir Wastiya of Ibn Taymiyyah. <coughs> He's categorized Islam. So somebody wrote to him saying to him can you explain to us what Islam is? And those people who wrote to Ibn Taymiyyah were actually judges from a place in Iraq. They were academics, they were judges, they were in court. And they wanted from Ibn Taymiyyah an explanation as to what Islam is. That clearly teaches us that it's not very easy. It's not as easy as thinking, well, Islam, well, it, is a, it is a tricky question, isn't it? And it doesn't matter how advanced you are within the realm of studying Islam and scholarship. They've, they've graduated and graduated and graduated to the extent that they became the judges of their city. And even then, they asked Ibn Taymiyyah to explain what Islam is. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he wrote a response between Salat al-Asr and Salat al-Maghrib, which is still being studied until today. 
he wrote it off the top of his head, and he and the way he structured it were in these three separate entities. He said Islam consists of belief, it consists of actions, and it consists of manners and etiquettes. And the reason why he said that, as been explained by some of the scholars, is because every one of these categories has had people deviate from the correct understanding of Islam because of that. Now, the most obvious one is belief. Okay, so the most obvious one is belief. So there's people who actually believe that you can worship the deceased. There's people who believe that um, the nephew of the Prophet ﷺ was the actual messenger. They actually believe that he is infallible and Muhammad ﷺ didn't complete the message. He's not actually the seal of prophets. And these people actually believe those things. And those things we can easily identify and reject. But in action, there is also a problem. And this is one of the biggest problems today. Because, unfortunately, if you speak to somebody who is extreme, you won't find many anomalies here. You won't. In actual fact, they will say that we are not upholding correct belief because we are compromising by living in the West. Therefore, your Tawheed is not complete. Why are you here then? Come and join us over there. So, I'm not trying to say that that's a correct understanding, but my point is that they will make apparent the words of Tawheed and they're against Shirk and we're trying to be orthodox and sticking to the, the correct understanding. But where they have created you know, corruption on the earth and has created uh, difficulty for more than one and a half billion people in the world is because of the second category. And the third category also has deviants within it and people deviating from the correct understanding of Islam. Therefore, they follow a track which is unrecognizable. It's not attached, it's not standardized to the correct Islam. And the ulama have given examples of people's manners. For example, there are sects who believe that we should focus only on number three but not pay much attention on one and two. And you will find them even in the UK where they will say you need to, you know, display good manners and all that. So he doesn't really matter. You ask him for a definition of what taqwa is, he will say, no, I don't know what taqwa is, but that's not important. Come with me for 40 days and we can go and teach people what the correct manners of Islam are. And when you come to the masjid, they will teach you about how to eat and how to go to the back. Etiquettes and manners, and they've gone extreme in that, but when it comes to the basic fundamentals and actions, they're lacking. So that's how they've deviated. And this is now making apparent itself how wise and how much justice and how correct Ibn Taymiyyah was in categorizing his book on Ajid al So let's see what Islam actually is. Islam, when it comes to belief, it teaches us that there is a difference between the Creator and the creation. And that creator is completely separate from his creation. And he doesn't resemble any one of his creation. And he's completely unique in himself. So we can't even imagine how or what he is. And even when we see him, and I ask Allah to make us of those who see him, we will not be able to comprehend him in his absolute sense, even when we are looking at him. That's how vast and how complete and unique he is as an entity himself. That's one of the basic fundamentals of Islam. Therefore, we will not worship a man. We will not say that he has a son, God has a son. We will not say he has a mother. We will not say God is within an idol or whatever. We don't believe in superstitions and all those things because, stemming from this, God is the one who created us and he's outside of the creation and he's not like the creation and he doesn't need the creation. And some of the ulama have actually said that Tawheed, which is commonly known to us into three different types, Tawheed, Ruhi, Ruhi, Asma, Sifat, is actually these two types. Where, is, where a person knows who the Creator is, and he knows that they have, or that Creator has certain names and attributes and actions which are befitting to him alone. So within belief, so that's one aspect of Tawheed. Also the other aspect of Tawheed is that we, of these two types of Tawheed, or that type of Tawheed necessitates the second type of Tawheed. Let me rephrase that. The first type of Tawheed is that we believe that there is a creator who is separate from his creation, unlike his creation, completely unique. And what makes him unique is that he has certain names, attributes and actions which are specific to him. If that is your creator, 
Therefore, nothing else deserves your worship, the second act or the second category of Tawheed, except him. And that's what makes him specific in his divinity. That's one very core fundamental of Islam. And if you leave that, then you will not be within the fold of Islam. That's one, that's one part of what we're talking about is belief. The second part is action. So if somebody is asking you, what is Islam? What is Islamic law? Why are your laws so strict? Why do you pray five times a day? Why do you wear certain clothes? Why don't you eat certain things? All of those kind of questions, when it comes to action, fall into one of these five things. So the Sharia, the, the, the legislation, the laws of Islam, has come to protect five very fundamental human rights, if you want to call it that. Yes, human rights. The Prophet ﷺ talked about human rights more than 1400 years ago, where in a place where nobody even thought about rights, let alone human rights. So now the Prophet ﷺ in his Sharia has come to protect these five things. Human life, a life of another person is protected and preserved, even if he is not a Muslim. We don't, the, the, the point is that we don't seek to annihilate everybody who differs with us. Islam actually came to protect their life as well as our lives. Human intellect, and again, intellect is very much similar to life, where I don't transgress against your intellect, I don't play with your intellect, I don't want people to be, Islam doesn't want people to be ignorant, let alone, I mean, irrespective of what religion they are, they want truth to prevail. And then you can make your choice based on that, whether you're Muslim or not. Intellect is preserved, and also included in that is the field of science, where a person, if he was to aspire to do something, invent something, create something, then that becomes his property and his right. And that's one of the things Islam has preserved. Another part of the Sharia which has come to preserve... So now we're talking about why do you go to the bathroom in a particular way? Why do you marry in a particular way? We looked at yesterday. All of those questions, any action is connected to one of these five things or maybe all of them or maybe some of them. Property. Islam came to preserve your property, your assets, your wealth. It doesn't like we looked at yesterday also, it's designed a framework for us so that our property does not get lost and our honour does not get lost. Islam has come to preserve the property of mankind irrespective of their religion and their honour and it has given everyone the free right to choose whatever religion and creed they want. This is the Sharia of Islam and this is what Islam has come to teach mankind. What about the third aspect? of Islam, and that is manners. So what is manners? How do we define manners? And when do we recognize what is good manners? The ulama have explained, this is actually taken from one of the very earliest definitions given by Hassan al-Basri, which is that manners in Islam refers to you preventing causing harm to anybody else. So if you're not driving properly, if you're not wearing a seatbelt properly, if you're smoking a cigarette, if there's any kind, of, any kind of harm that's emanating from yourself, we can safely say that that person is now displaying bad manners. It could be speech, it could be anything. If you then are conscious to the fact that, no, I don't want to harm other people, that still doesn't define what good manners is. Because you could be self-harming, or you might not be harming other people, but not spreading or you know, giving the image of goodness towards other people. So Islam then says, manners, the second part of manners is that you spread good towards other people. You stop harming people, and then you show a good side towards them. However, I mean, these two things are quite common, and it's even found in people who are not Muslim. But Islam teaches us something which is a level above that. I mean, there's people in certain countries in the world right now, and they are non-violent religions and those kind of things, but when they feel that there's a certain community in their, in their country that needs to be removed, the third one is not existent. They are burning people alive, they're driving people out of their homes, and they're doing all kinds of tyranny to, towards these people, even though that they say that our creed and our way of life is a peaceful, non-violent way of life. And this is why Islam is very, very specific when it comes to... That's not good manners in Islam. Good manners in Islam would be then to remain patient when you are being harmed. So now, if you are truly a non-violent and a peaceful religion, like Islam, we can clearly and safely say that Islam is peaceful, even though it's not within the actual definition of what we're looking at. It's the broader example that we get from the whole spectrum, where 
man is now, we can summarize in saying that you don't harm other people. In actual fact, you do the opposite, which is you spread good towards people in your manners, in the way you speak, in your body language, etc. And then, after that, there will be a time where you will be tested in your interactions with people. And that's where your manners is actually very, very important. You have to remain patient. Somebody swears at you, somebody does something bad to you, somebody tries to rip you off, somebody kicks your door. You have to remain patient. You have to remain patient. If you lose that, you lose it, then you are not displaying manners. You will end up falling in one of those two, or well, maybe obviously defying those two from before. This is Islam in a nutshell. What is science? This is a d definition I've taken from the dictionary, and this is the one that I've highlighted. The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study. Look how long the definition is. The systematic... It's not being broken down because they don't need that breakdown. And like we've said, Islam is quite simple. That you recognize a creator who's not like the creation and you worship him. And then what are the objectives of Islam? Or the actions and the manners. But that definition there of a science, you know, or science as a field, as a subject, clearly tells you something which is very important. That Islam and science are two completely separate entities. And to mix them is injustice. So now for a person to say, well, I don't believe in God because it's not scientifically proven, then that's wrong. Because by definition, we're looking at two separate things. And we're going to look at that a bit more. But the definition of science here, the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. So what they're saying is, is that anything which has been created, the natural world, something that we can physically see which is tangible, and that we study and investigate that thing, that becomes science. Therefore God, believing in God, is not science. It's not scientific. Believing in angels is not scientific. Believing in a winged horse is not scientific because it's not observed and it's not experimented with and it's not in the natural physical world. That is what is science. What are the objectives of science? Now this is something that I've taken out from a person called David Miller and he seems like a very pseudo-scientist so excuse his language here and I know that this doesn't represent all scientists but what he's saying is it seems to me, oh sorry, it seems to have been discarded for or an ob obliviousness to the difference between objective truth and warranted truth that has led to the doctrine that there is no objective or absolute truth. What he's saying here, the next bit will explain, you still hear people assert that all truth is relative, meaning no more than that, sorry, no more than that no truth can be established. Which, uh, what he is basically saying here, that there is nothing which is factual nothing is factual there is no object there is no objective or absolute truth that's what he's saying and he carries on talking about different theories and this is actually part of his conclusion in one of his uh, essays but basically the objective of science kind of fits in with this and that's why i've chosen it is because everything is up for study everything is up for scrutiny there is no such thing which is absolute fact. For Muslims it makes more sense that we will say that looking at that definition and that objective that it makes more sense to have one superior all-knowing being that is external to what we see as the natural world and the laws of the natural world, laws of physics etc and all of those things who has then given us so there is objectivity there, there is truthful and factfulness there and then he gives us that fact and he reveals it down to us rather than being in a constant state of subjectivity. Are you with me so far? Yeah? There's a lot of long words here. What the scientists are saying is that there is no truth. How do I know this table exists? I don't. I have to prove it. How do I know the sun is there? I have to prove it. How do I know that the sun is not moving? I don't. I have to prove it. And even when I do prove it, I don't know if that's actual, actual research. That research that I've done could be criticized afterwards. Therefore, mankind, according to scientists, and the scientist objective is that we live in a, a loop of study and not knowing. Nothing is real. Nothing is fact. 
Whereas for Muslims, and this is what I'm saying, that science is definitely one thing and Islam is another. Where Islam is, it makes more sense. And even scientists themselves have admitted that it makes more sense. Because everything is a theory to them. And even this as a theory makes more sense than other theories with other sci- with a lot of scientists. There's actually one person in Harvard who actually says that it, it, there is no chance whatsoever that we've come by uh, coincidence. It, it's like 0.0000 billion percent you know, uh, chance that you've come about by... That's a whole different tangent. We're not talking about atheism here. But we're talking about the fact that it makes more sense that you have something which is outside what we understand as the natural world, who has created us and created that natural world, whilst he is being external. And whilst he's external, he sends down onto that natural world a way for us to operate. That's what Islam is saying. And, in, and a good example of that is what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said. He said, for example, and we're going to get to this, how do we know Islam is real? How do we know Allah exists? Now, the sun we will argue, didn't come about by chance. And like we said before, scientists would actually agree with that. They're saying that there has to be a plausible reason, a scientific reason. If they can prove that Allah created it, and that's scientifically proven, then they will accept that. But there is no way, because Allah is outside of science. You see the, you see the conundrum here. So now the problem here is, what we do understand is that there is a sun in the sky. And that sun moves around and it operates. What if the sun says... Okay, well, at five o'clock, I'm supposed to co- I'm supposed to go down, but I'm going to wait for half an hour. Can the sun do that? Has the sun ever done that? The sun, the sun has never done that. The sun goes down in a systematic manner, and it comes up in a systematic manner. It does that in summer, it does that in winter, and it's been doing that for billions and billions of years. And it's not done. It. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, if that's the sun, who's not being given a sharia, it's not being given free will. What about you? What happens when you say, well, I'll wait for half an hour. I'll wait for 20 years to turn back to my Lord and make tawbah and start praying and taking Islam seriously. What's going to happen to you? The same thing that would happen if the sun wasn't going to operate in its proper manner. It would implode. And your existence will not be the way that Allah has created you for. Therefore, what we understand from this, and we're going to get to this also, is that there's always a connection between what we see as the universal signs and with the signs within the Sharia. And that's how we know that the Sharia is correct. And that's how we know Allah exists. So if Allah has told us to do something, even whether it's scientifically proven or not, we know that there is goodness in it. Whether science later comes out and affirms it, whether science goes that far, because some of those things our Sharia tells us to do, but science can't understand it. But there are certain things that science is telling us to do right now, and the Prophet already told us 1400 years ago, and that's good for you as a human being, and that's already been established. So my point here is that the Sharia is always going to tell you, for you, what is upright for you to have a good and wholesome and healthy life, and for the reason why you've been created. And there are signs within the universe which affirm that message in the Sharia. What are, so now this is the next question. So now we've looked at what science is, we've looked at the objective of science, and now here's a question, what is object morality? Now object morality is another way of saying what are the akhlaq in the religion of science. Because we call it akhlaq, and they call it object morality. What that means is, how do you know that you sitting like that is moral? How do I know that I'm wearing this jacket right now is moral? It might be in the future that this is immoral. Wearing clothes, how backward is that? It might be, you never know. So well, that's what science is saying. Science is saying that we have to investigate every single aspect of our lives until we know that that is proven to be correct, but even once we prove it, that still could be wrong. So object morality with science. Science allows for no set definition for morality. This is my point. In its own basis, science is a religion or a way of understanding the human or the, or the tangible, the, nature and investigating that. Objective is that we continue doing that and we will never really know. What are some of the akhlaq that you get from having that as a, as, as a, as a, as a lifestyle? There is no morality. And we're going to get to how it, you know, even, again, like I said, it's not about atheists, but even atheists 
research has shown that those people who don't believe in God are less moral than those people who believe in God. Why? Because desires and sin are subjective. Islam has told us over 1,000 Riba is wrong, Zina is wrong, self-harm is wrong, so don't do drugs, don't smoke cigarettes. But they will say, okay, well it was wrong at one time, but it's not wrong anymore. And that is subjective, that can always change. And what they've said is all of this, desires and your akhlaq and the morality that you think is moral, whatever you think is upright, is completely relative. And what they are saying today is that as long as you are not harming yourself, then that is good manners. You can do it, it doesn't matter. So if you want to do drugs, as long as you are not harming the people around you, we will facilitate you taking your drugs. And people are even getting drugs, A-class drugs, supplements from the NHS, because they are not harming themselves. I actually saw this report on the BBC whilst I was in Saudi, where a woman, she was sitting next to a person on the bus, and the person on the bus had his headphones on, and he was watching pornography. And she sat next to him, and she thought, well, this guy's hiding, he's got his head on, he's got his hood on, etc., and he's hiding. What are you doing? He looks, bit, he looks a bit fishy. So she looked over, and she goes, I was horrified. And she became very annoyed and very, very angry. She didn't say anything to him, but this is what she was saying in the article. And she was saying, how dare he do that in a public... Pro it's public. There could be kids, there could be anything. But then she went on to say, well, wait a minute. And this is their deen. This is their religion. She then ended up saying that, no, he's actually within his right to do that. He's not harming me. He's not harming anyone around him. He's being very careful. He's being secretive so nobody can see. He's got headphones on. He's not harming anyone. It's fine. Who am I? to transgress against his public liberty. This is object morality. This is the akhlaq, and this is what they are saying now, is what your definition of good manners is. Remember back to the Islamic definition, you don't harm the people, but you portray goodness, and you have patience, in, in, in times when you are tested. But here, there is no set code. This is included in the broader definition of science, which could include political science. Now, the reason why I put that there is because science is not specific to the, the study of natural things in a natural state. So it doesn't necessarily mean that we go to a laboratory and you know, break down water particles and that kind of stuff. Science is actually much more broader when you look at that definition. So, for example, democracy will be a science. And all these different things that stem from the natural world and how you operate in that natural world will be a science. Now, what people have said, including scientists, is that the way that you know something is correct is how? Is on the effects that it has on mankind. So now, if you think that this is what you should be doing and this is your objective, and these are the manners that you want to portray, fair enough. But what effect is that having on mankind? And even politicians in this country have said that democracy has gone so far to the left side, to the liberty side, that it's opened up doors for people to do criminal activities without you know, going unchecked. And the effects on society then has obviously had a negative impact. So to conclude this point here, science doesn't have a strict set of objectives, rather it has faith uh, in subjectivity. And this is very important. Because science will say, we don't believe in faith, everything has to be believed, everything has to be proven. But once even when I prove it, it could be wrong. What does that it could be mean? It means that they believe in something on the unseen. Not believing in God, but believing that Nabil tomorrow could possibly prove me wrong. Therefore, they do have faith in something. You with me on that point? They have faith in subjectivity, not faith in yaqeen. We will say, Hudan lil muttaqeen, alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. We have faith also, but like we said before, having that faith in an external be being that is not within the, the realm of science, outside of his creation, makes much more sense than living in this constant state of subjectivity. However, 
both sides. So now this is what I'm trying to say also, is that science and Islam doesn't have to, you don't have to choose one of these outlets. It's not like that. Both of these sides can agree that, and, and faith and theories aside, facts and theories aside, that a way of life can only be judged on its universal, universality and its impact on human life and society. So Islam will say, Muslims will say Islam is the truth because it's universal, it's not restricted to time and place. That same Islam that the Prophet ﷺ was uh, abiding by and enforcing and, and, and legislating by 1400 years ago in a desert, speaking to people who didn't know English, people who are very, very backward in the way that they're very primitive in the way they used to think, but he was much more advanced to the extent that had he had legislation in the world today, even according to some philosophers, he could even solve the problems of Europe today. That was 1400 years ago. So for us as Muslims, we can say, well, Islam is very, very universal. It's not restricted to time, it's not restricted to a place or language or culture, and that's how we know it's true. Science, on the other hand, what impact does it have on society? What does it have on your, uh, your spirituality? You're constantly living in a phase of subjectivity. Then you have to decide. Note, it's very important at this stage, that scientists themselves knew this point very, very well, that they can't continue living in that stage of doubt. Well, maybe tomorrow Nabi will prove me wrong. Once he does it, how do I know that the other brothers don't prove me wrong? And how do I know that that doesn't continue? So they said, even Plato and even Darwin himself have, well, Darwin's, you know, uh, contested within the folk. Because no, what he actually said is that I'm actually a Christian. He actually said that. A Jew. Now, I've read that he said that he was actually a Christian. He came from a Christian background. And he actually said he believes in Christianity. And there's one point in his life, at least we can say, Einstein. At one point in his life, Darwin, he came from a very, very strong Christian background. His father and everybody was very, very Christian. And he even said himself that, I don't see a clash in me saying that, you know, man originated from apes and the evolution theory, and then belief in a God. He didn't see a, a clash in that. Plato, who is arguably, you know, the father of democracy and, and, you know, these other sciences that we see today, all of them believed in some kind of creator and originator. At least at one point in their life. Therefore, the role of Islam and science are two completely separate things. Now we can firmly establish that, that Islam is telling us to do one thing, and science is telling us to live in an in, in ongoing series, series of subjectivity. But Islam is not telling us to do this. Islam is telling us to have yaqeen, know that you believe in a God, you're going to be resurrected, and he's going to ask you about your deeds, and there are certain actions and certain manners that you need to implement so that you can prepare in meeting him. Right, so it looks like this. Islam is definitely one thing, and science is definitely another thing, but there are things that overlap with one another. And that question mark has been put there because there are so many examples, and you know, we really don't have time for it. So what I've done actually is the rest of this lecture is giving down, setting down principles in Islam which will then enable us to understand its relationship with science. So Islam teaches us that there can possibly be an overlap, but it doesn't make science the benchmark. This is very, very important. So we can't say, do I believe in God? Is Muhammad actually real? Is the Qur'an correct? Well, what does science say about it? Because you can't, you can't do that. Because science itself will say, well, we don't agree with him right now, but we might agree with him in the future. It might become evident that some of the things that he has said is actually factual. And then what are you going to do then? So... There's two different paradigms altogether. So principle number one, Islam in its very nature is something unproduced by man. Islam is full of miracles. Therefore man can't really understand what those miracles have stemmed, where those miracles have stemmed from. The Prophet has told us about Jannah, he's told us about the hellfire, he's told us about punishment, he's told us about beings that have 600 wings. You can't understand that. Therefore, to have faith means to believe in a realm of the unseen. And that unseen world has been given to us as a message through prophets and messengers, which are telling us that, look, well, you haven't come from nothing, and you're not going to go back to nothing. And that nothing you cannot see right now, because there is no point in you seeing right now, because that, that is why you are being tested. So what is a miracle in Islam? A miracle in Islam is something which is an extraordinary act which is outside the realm of science. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu when he was young, he had his heart cut open, his chest cut open, open heart surgery on a four-year-old, where there was, there was no medicine at that time. But Jibreel did that, and he sealed his heart back up, that is a miracle. That's outside what is ordinary for human life. But then how do we know that that is actually real? How do we know that that actually happened? Because, like we said before, there is a relationship with the unseen and the seen which gives us an indication that this unseen is actually real. Principle number two, Islam doesn't call to blind faith. And this is carrying on from what we just said, that there are certain miracles that's been given to the Prophet Sallallahu He's a messenger who's so telling us about the unseen. But that unseen that he's telling us about is not blind. Is that you're not following him just saying that because he said it. There is proof for what he is saying. Islam calls us to ponder on the relationship between the universe and our existence. Allah says in the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقٌ وَعَدْلًا The word of your Lord has been completed with justice and truth, or truth and justice. And the words of Allah cannot be changed. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said about this, just as there is no discrepancy in his universal law, like we said about the sun, like we can say about the moon, like we can say about water particles, some of those things in the universe are there and they are factual and they are stagnant and they are not changing. And there are no discrepancies in the way that Allah has created this universe. Therefore, if He is the one who is perfect in the way that we can see the creation and He's perfect in the way that He's created human beings, therefore it is not conceivable that He has given the sun and the moon and the universe laws for them to abide by. And that's what science recognizes also, the laws of physics, etc., then how is it that Allah creates you without laws? How is it that you are here without laws? Does that make sense? Therefore, there are no discrepancies there in the world that we see. Therefore, there cannot be no discrepancy in the law that He has given and placed down to us to follow. Therefore, there will always be a relationship between the unseen and the seen in order for us to recognize what is truthful in both. Because we have to function in the seen in order for us to prepare in the unseen. In actual fact, the more you believe in the unseen, the better you will become in the seen. And that's why atheists don't have the same level of morality as religious people. I'm not just talking about Islam. People believe in the unseen, whether you're a Buddhist or a Hindu, or the, that drives them to do good deeds. If you take that completely, you strip it completely away, do whatever you want. There is no morality. I can do whatever I want as long as I don't get arrested. In order for us to recognize what is truthful. So that is, that is it. You're laughing, but that is it. Because when you get arrested is when they, they perceive you causing harm and being a threat to other people. If you are harming yourself by drinking too much and taking drugs and doing all those things that religious people will say is haram, then there is no sin on that. You're not doing anything wrong. You can smoke a hundred cigarettes a day. You can get arrested for that. You won't. Islam will say even one is haram. Even, even a little bit of that is haram. And the reason why we know that is because we believe in the unseen. We know that we can't harm our bodies. Why? Because that could kill us. And that we are going to be asked about. And there are so many different reasons why we wouldn't do certain things. Because we have morals. Because we believe in the unseen. Because we believe in the unseen, we become firmer in the scene. In actual fact, there may be things in the realm of the scene which science can't explain. But Islam has given an explanation for And this is what I was saying to you before. There are certain things that Islam can accommodate for. And that subjectivity continues in science, and they might even just say, look, either become dismissive and say, no, it doesn't exist, like they do with the world of the jinn, or they will say, we just don't know. And I've actually heard that Rukia services are being found on the NHS. Did you hear about that? You can get Rukia on the NHS. Now what they've said is, it's a placebo. Somebody thinks he's getting a cure by sitting in the corner of a room and somebody's reciting Qur'an and they are getting better by it but they just think you're, it's psychological, it's not real how can somebody recite something in a foreign language and then you get improved by that mental disorder has gone away magically without any medicine get off it so they've said that this is all a placebo so now what we're saying is that you haven't got an explanation for it so you can't become dismissive and according to your own standards that is wrong. Because you can't categorically say that is wrong. Yeah? Because everything is subjective. 
cures for disease, the Prophet ﷺ said that there is a cure for every single disease, and we know that, we know that for a fact. And the Prophet ﷺ has also told us that the more you indulge in things that you are not supposed to do, diseases will appear. And reversing that would mean that you have to reverse those things and those things that you shouldn't be doing. So now, there is an overlap, but there are also things that science can't cater for where Islam has catered for. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Islam is scientific. And the purpose of Islam is science. No, we've already talked about how Islam has a, a three-tier system. or well, We'll call it three-tier, but we're not trying to split belief with action. Because your action is connected to the belief. And your manners are connected to action and belief. So it's not like that. I shouldn't have put it like that. But all of that makes up Islam. Principle number three. Science can never be a benchmark for truth in and of itself. Why? Why is science not the truth when it comes to belief? Now this is very important. It's a very important question in the way that I've phrased it. Islam is actually pro-science. But Islam is actually pro-science in, in the field that Islam says that it should be operating in and not transgressing into a field that it shouldn't be operating in. Are you with me with that? So if we're saying that there are um, advancements in medicine or advancements in transport and technology, and that is really good, go for it. And we will see examples of how Muslims have actually helped contribute to this modern world today, including things that we see and depend upon every single day, Islam has helped produce that for us today. But Islam is not saying that science is the benchmark for the truth. And there, that is where the conflict appears. Why is Islam not saying that? Because number one, it lacks the above. It lacks the manners, it lacks the actions, and the akhlaq and all those things. And sometimes it can't explain, explain the miraculous beginnings of creation, nor the nature of how to preserve it. So... This now goes back to belief, that we believe that there is an entity that is outside of creation, outside of science and all of those things, and then created science, and then created the, the, the natural world and how it operates. For us, that makes more sense. And we know that makes sense because what he has done is he's created the creation in an upright manner, and he's given us laws to follow, and if you follow those laws, guess what? You in your nature will be upright, you'll be happy, you'll be tranquil. You'll be living a life for the purpose that you've been created for. And that's been trialed and tested. So that's how we know that is real. For Muslims, just because we may not be able to understand the reality of something, it doesn't mean that we need to, or that we, need to, or that we are supposed to. So you can't end up denying the belief in God, or the belief in angels, or the belief in the Jannah, or a hellfire, or a, a book that has all of decree in it, or the life in the, in the grave, and all those kind of things that we connect to the unseen. We will say, science, you need to stop there. Because for us, science has its own paradigm, and this is a paradigm where we are told we will not understand, and we are not supposed to understand, and even if you try to understand, you will not be able to understand it, because we don't have the faculties to understand it. Therefore, you have not been given the tools to understand it. Yeah? For example, just because a person can't figure... This is very important because rationally this doesn't make sense. I can't... I don't know God exists because I can't prove His existence. I can't believe in, in angels because I don't... So for example, let's give an example, let's change it. If I give you an equation, a really hard mathematical equation, and you can't figure it out, what would your response be? You don't know. That's exactly what Muslims will say. We don't know. And maybe I don't care, because I'm not supposed to know. Would it be rational for you to say, well, I don't know what this equation means, I don't know how to figure it out, therefore mathematics does not exist. Does that make sense? Does not make sense? They don't do that themselves. What they do do is they try to figure it out, and as they are trying to figure it out, they will continue admitting defeat, that look, we're still trying, we're still working it out. Why do people get migraines? Until today, people don't know. Why do people get abscesses in their body? Until today, they do not know. What is the cure for cancer? Until today, they do not know. But we're still trying to figure it out. Some of those things, they will have to admit defeat and eventually and say, look, we have no cure for it. And it's from the unseen. Therefore, scientists will then admit that they believe in the unseen. That's why, why don't you just go back to the very first plausible, not even theory, fact, which is that you have been created from something 
external and he's told you that there is an unseen world that you are not going to understand. But what Islam does teach is to go and understand to the best of your ability and when you have, when you have you know, exercised all means, then just stop, that's it, class. Another reason why science is not the benchmark, because science admits ignorance. It knows that everything is subjective and theoretical. Even the most stonewall facts are debatable, we've talked about this before. This shows science, and this is the point, is always changing. Therefore, there is no truth. What was truth yesterday is not truth tomorrow, because it's always changing. That means it's open to criticism, and it can also be self-contradictory. Can the fact be contradictory? Can the fact erase itself and replace it with another fact? Then there is no such thing as fact anymore. Therefore, I do not know if I exist. I don't know if the world exists. Nothing is factual anymore. And Allah talks about this in the Quran. Allah has diverted their, their brains and their intellects and their sights and their insight, as some of the Mufassirun have said, not just physical sight, the ability to understand has been diverted away from them because they have chosen to live in a particular way of continual conjecture. And Islam has already talked about that. Another reason why science is not the benchmark is because, if we look at everything that we've talked about before, is that science had it been the benchmark for working out what is right and what is wrong, then whose science do we use? Every one of us has intellect, everyone has scientific knowledge, but every one of us differ in that knowledge and intellect. So then what becomes the benchmark within the benchmark? If we're going to say science is the benchmark, prove it by science that I have to believe in X, Y and Z, then what, be, what sets that benchmark as science? Because tomorrow you can say, well, that's not science anymore. I've got a better science. And what we know from that, which is very, very bad, is now people believe in this thing where they feel that they are superior now to those people who are there before us. So for millions of years, humans have been living on this earth. But what we are saying now is that we are the best of humans. And the, the people before us didn't have anything. Based on this setting of science and intellect as the benchmark. Also, like religion, science has always been infiltrated with agendas. Now, we're going to admit that religion, Islam itself, and all religions have been infiltrated with agendas. People have waswas, people have uh, nifaq, they claim to be Muslim, they claim to be religious, but they're actually not, and they are spreading a, a sinister agenda. And if we're going to say that science becomes the benchmark, then science doesn't become uh, free from that either. But what becomes different from science and Islam and religion in that scenario is that religion will always have those people who have that firm belief in the unseen, whereas science doesn't. So, for example, how do we know that medicine for us today is actually good for us? Because there's so many theories and so many scientists actually saying that, well, antibiotics is actually very, very bad for you. Paracetamol is actually very bad for you. Ibuprofen and all these things that you give to your children, little kids, they can't handle that and they shouldn't be having that kind of medication. However, mainstream followers of religion remain without sinister agendas. So you will always find people who are upright and understand the principles above belief in the unseen, the action and the manners. It's more than reasonable to suggest that good people remain on earth who are following the correct interpretation of religion than those people who are following science blindly. Therefore, you can't make science as an objective uh, benchmark. Principle number four in Islam, Islam, like we've said, is not anti-science, it is pro-development, but it will not use science to challenge those three points that we've mentioned before. We will not say, Let's challenge our belief in Allah using science. Let's challenge our actions believing, um, using science. Let's challenge our manners using science. And Ibn Taymiyyah's work is extensive on this, and he has proven in each one of these three things how Islam is different to science in that aspect. So, for example, he says the intellect, which is sound, can never contradict the religion. If you think that 
This thing in the religion is wrong, belief in Allah is wrong, I don't believe in Allah, he doesn't exist, I can't scientifically prove it. Then Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, there's one or two scenarios. Number one, either your intellect is corrupt, or number two, you do not understand how Islam affirms the existence of Allah. Not that there's a problem with Islam, in a nutshell, there's a problem with your intellect and the intelligence and the, and the utensils you are using to try and establish belief. Therefore, sound intellect and science will never clash with religion in itself. He said that they don't deny the prophets, but they deny his messengers. None of the other creation deny Allah. Okay, so we have, we believe in the unseen, and we believe in other created beings, and none of them actually disbelieve in the existence of the unseen. Not the angels and not the inanimate from the sun and the moon. We've talked about that before, how the moon and the sun have its own orbit and it doesn't disobey Allah in that. Nor do they say that because they use the creation to their advantage, but then they are now in a position to deny him. However, okay, so basically, in a nutshell here, we know that Allah exists and if there is, an, if there is a contradiction or a clash between science and your intellect and religion, then there is a problem in the understanding, not necessarily meaning that there is an actual clash between the two. How do we know Islam is pro-science and not anti-development when it comes to our understanding of actions in Islam? He said there are two ways to establish truthfulness in Lordship. How do we know, how can we become sincere towards Allah in our actions? Looking at his signs, so when you see his signs, you will ponder and you will realize that he, uh, uh, he actually exists. And he also mentions Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that, for example, you knowing the signs of something existing doesn't necessarily mean that you need to see that thing itself in order for it to exist. For example, he says, if you see the, the, the rays of the sun in the morning, but you can't see the sun itself, it's cloudy or it's still coming up or, or something like that. If you see the rays, you see the effects, you see the signs. Does that necessarily mean that the sun doesn't exist because you haven't physically seen the sun? Obviously not. So this is what he is saying. In our action, we can see the signs of Allah in our daily lives. That promotes and encourages for us to do these actions. We don't necessarily need to see Allah in order for us to act uh, for Him and for His sake. And another thing which establish, establishes truthfulness in Lordship in Islam is the idea of servitude, ubudi, uh, connection with your Creator. And we all have, and this part is part of our future, we all have this whether we ex accept it or not. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying. Because it's essential. Allah says the very first command in the Qur'an, the very first command is not to obey your parents or to give in charity or fast in Ramadan or to praise Allah. Ya ayyuhal nas, O mankind, u'budu rabbakum. Worship your Lord, the one who created you and everyone that came before you so that you can be upright, taqun. So you can do what is right, you can have that framework that we talked about before. What Ibn Taymiyyah said about this ayah here, he said that this is talking to the fitrah and not to the other. Allah here in this ayah is telling us and commanding us and He's going to our senses when He is saying this. He is saying, you have a Lord and you very well know that you have a Lord who has created you from nothing and He is external, so worship Him. So then now what He is saying that there are two ways of recognizing your Lordship, either through the signs, but there is something which is much more profound than that, that every single one of us in our lives will have at some stage, and some people have it more than others, irrespective of what religion you are, what gender you are, what culture you come from, a moment in your life where you think, I actually think that there is a God there, and I believe that I need to ask Him, or He is testing me, you will be given that crossroads moment, definitely. And that's what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying here, because that's what this ayah is referring to, because it is appealing to our senses. Therefore, Islam teaches a message of recognizing his signs, contemplate, ponder, realize, and bringing about betterment because of it, because it's calling to our senses. Islam calls to our senses. Another way that we know Islam is real is through our manners. And deducing from the above what we've just said about how the connection there is between the created outside and our own creation here, 
is that the sounder the Iman, the stronger your belief in the unseen, the sounder the intellect will become. And then this will create morals and upright behavior. And the weaker the belief in the unseen, the weaker the intellect, and the weaker the upright morals, or the morality, so to speak. And this is what I was talking to you about before. This is only just a couple of years ago, and it's taken from a Guardian um, article that they got from France themselves, the, the, first, the French press agency in Paris, where they did a, a discovery or a poll or some kind of a research where they said that atheists tend to be uh, seen as immoral even by other atheists themselves and religious belief widely viewed as safeguard uh, against grossly immoral conduct. Now, the more you believe in religion, the more you believe in some kind of the unseen, it will give you some kind of uprightness in the way you think and the way you behave and the way you approach life, and then this will give you morals and behavior and a code of conduct to live by. If you, do, if you destroy all of this, then they themselves have admitted that you will probably end up being more immoral. And in fact, I would say that there is actually a conspiracy now to reduce religiousness by creating a topic like this, where people think that they have to choose either Islam or science, that there has to be a divide. And the reason why I'm saying that there is this conspiracy in myself, and I'm sure you probably agree with some of this, is that science is used to create doubts when it comes to your religious belief, whether it's the belief aspect, whether it's the action aspect, whether it's the manner aspect. Science is being used for you to, you know, at least doubt it, if not contradict religion because of scientific facts. So, for example, you would have a particular uh, set of cultures and, and norms in your home, but they will say, well, actually, that's unscientific. It's not scientific that men and women are segregated or women have to wear, wear a particular uh, a dress code or that kind of stuff. So what they will say, that's not scientific. So then what they will do is they'll create doubts. Shubuhat means doubts in your religious identity because it's not scientific enough. You're actually backward. You can carry on because we live in a, in a democracy, but you're not right because it's not scientific. So they'll try and create that inferiority complex where you think, okay, well, you know, I have to believe in my religion even though I shouldn't be doing it, or you are more right than I am. But, okay, so that when it comes, that's when it comes down to your belief. But when it comes down to your desires, science is often overlooked. So when it comes to, for example, scientifically, drinking alcohol is bad for you. Scientifically, smoking cigarettes is fact, it's bad for you. Um, you know, certain orientations are bad for you. Yeah? Certain things that you do with your sexuality is bad for you. But when it comes to science and that relationship with your desires, it's overlooked. So this is the conspiracy that I think is happening in certain uh, outlets, is that Religion and science has been created that divide. When it comes to your belief, it's not scientific. But in order to reduce your level of morality, they overlook the science. Because that's the actual part where we will say, well, it's not scientific that you are leading that particular lifestyle. However, Islam doesn't promote an us v them attitude. It doesn't. Islam is not saying, well, look at these, look how bad and barbaric and backward we feel that some people are with their lifestyle choices. We are not against them, and we are not against anyone in society. Rather, Islam's relationship with science is more like the following. Science would probably put itself up here, and everything else secondary. But let me ask you a question now. If a person was to pray five times a day, and then think, you know what, I'm not going to go to school, I'm not going to go look after my family, I'm not even going to go to work, I'm just going to carry on praying all day. Is that allowed? It's not allowed at all. In actual fact, you'll be sinful. So now, the reason why it's right in the middle and it's red, because that's the purpose of your creation. You have to realize that that's why you're being put here. And these things here, the, 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 the things on the side, are actually governed by the one in the middle. However, however we are not against the others. There's a time and a place for your family and economy. And the circles can continue, you can broaden that spectrum as much as you want. 
But these are just examples. So what we're saying here, Islam is not us and them. Islam would have science here as well, probably. You can put that there, it's fine. But there is a time and a place for each one. And this one here would dictate the morals and the actions and the behaviors and the belief for those other things. And the proof of this is that Allah has sent the Prophet as a as a mercy to mankind. And this is the last bit of the of the lecture where I'd like to prove uh, factually, if I can say that, how uh, Islam has actually not been against science, and actually Islam has been pro-science. And like I said before, these Muslim scientists, for when I mean, we're talking about a period of about over a thousand years, so it's not a joke, because our Western civilization here has only been around for about a hundred. It's only a small blip. What we see in all these advancements is still a very small blip in human existence. A thousand years, we're talking about centuries and centuries of Muslim development and establishment in itself as, as, as a superpower and then advancements within that generation and that, you know, that empire has clearly shown that we have been around for a very, very long time. And the reason why I put this here, that the Prophet has been sent as a mercy to mankind, I've said this in other lectures also, I would me personally argue that the Prophet no, he wasn't a scientist, he wasn't a doctor, he wasn't a... Uh, uh, a pediatrician and all the, he wasn't that, he was a messenger from Allah and he was sent as a mercy to teach us what is guidance now from that guidance you have expertise and other people have expertise you will be able to extrapolate from that because that's your expertise, that's what you have studied and then you can see well he is actually a mercy of mankind because I can actually develop something in architecture, in medicine, in, in technology, in all those kind of things I would even argue that all of these advancements that we're about to see right now goes back and we have actually proven this in certain scenarios where people who, like Khawarizmi himself and Biruni and other people, in the introduction of their books have actually even seen that all these people have actually said that I owe this to being being guided to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and have actually extracted this from my religious understanding of the text. So all of this goes back to who? Their master. The Imam So look at some of the advancements in maths For example, Muslim mathematicians created a shift from using new Roman numerals to numbers At that time they used to have very long equations when they were using X's and V's and I's If you look at the numbers, even number 1 is an Arabic number Even the number 2, if you slip it, if you rotate it 90 degrees to the right, it's an Arabic number Number 3, the same thing Number 9, number 10, all of these numbers actually stem from using numbers. And Muslims had actually done that. And that has caused a lot of influence in math uh, within our generation. Because now, all of these things that we are using, and binaries that we are using, computers and all those things, they work on binaries, zeros and ones. In order to be able to spread and always locate Makkah, uh, Muslim mathematicians had to establish a way of being uh, pioneers in astronomy because they used to travel all over the place but they always had to find a way of looking at where the moon is, where the stars are, etc. and working out where Makkah is. So what they did is they created a system of using trigonometry, of using angles to work out that would be the way. And that's what we've got as a compass right now. That is obviously very good, compass, and that's you know, pivotal today. But what they did is they started looking at angles, and they said, okay, well, if you can make an angle like that, and we dig down on the earth like that, then we can create civil engineering. And civil engineering basically means your roads, your pavements, your, your canals, your, your sanitation routes, your water pumps, all of that is coming through trigonometry that Islam had already established a very, very, very long time ago. But what they were doing is not only looking at how they can go down on the earth, they were actually looking at how they can go up and into space, into the universe, and how they can use trigonometry to work out the distance to the moon, for example. And they had done that a very, very long time ago. In mathematicians as well, in mathematics also, we have Khawarizmi. And Khawarizmi was the man who created algorithms. And algorithms today are used for screens. You will not have any screen in front of you had it not been through the findings of Khawarizmi's algorithms. Algorithms, don't ask me how it works, I'm not a mathematician, 
but algorithms are used for screens. And without this, we wouldn't have that today. Ibn Shatir developed works carried out by the Greeks. So this is a very important point, and I put this here because this clearly shows you that Islam is not anti-science. In actual fact, it will get findings from a non-Muslim Greeks, and it will develop that for the betterment of mankind, but it will not transgress in 1, 2, and 3 that we talked about. It sees its place there, and it sees that place there. However, our advancements in science will be for the sake of belief, action, and manners. So even Shatu have got some of the stuff that the Greeks have been talking about when it comes to orbits and planets and all those things, and he actually worked out how the planets were in orbit in his time. And there was also consensus between the scholars of Islam when a time where people actually believed that the earth was flat, that the earth is a sphere. And the very early Muslim scholars had already established that it's, it's, it's a sphere. In medicine, Ibn Sina has a book called The Canon of Medicine, and that is the cornerstone of medicine until this very day. The findings that he has found in that book has been depended on through modern science and, and medicine. The Muslims were the ones who introduced the concept of universities and hospitals and operations and advancing medicine. We had universities and hospitals uh, whilst, whilst this part of the world actually only had a two-tier system. Either you are a lord or a peasant. Now, you can understand the problem with that, because what would happen is, I live in my house here, and Nabil's a lord. He comes knocking on my door and he says, right, mate, you're my teff. Give me some of your, your, your livestock or your wheat, or whatever you've got. Otherwise, I'm going to take everything. Yes, my lord, and I'll give it to you. But then the armor comes, and he says, actually, you are my turf. What am I supposed to do? Am I, am I able to fight for my I'm a peasant. I've got absolutely nothing. So I was getting robbed day and night, literally. That's how it was. They didn't even have enough clean water, so they used to make alcoholic drinks to drink. And they used to be, the only thing that they could eat was pig and that kind of stuff. And it wasn't a very nutritious diet. The average lifespan was 30 years old. The lifespan at that time was 30 years old. And Islam says, you hit your peak at 40. But the average lifespan then is 30. At that point, and this is known as the Dark Ages, you can Google it if you don't believe me, Dark Ages in Europe. Uh, at that time, Islam was talking about universities, and we were talking about hospitals, we were talking about having operations. And some of these people, they didn't even have... Uh, a sanitary system in their homes. They used to go out and share public sanitation. Ibn Hayyan used alchemy and distillation, distillation to separate liquids and boil them. Uh, and this then became the, the basis of modern chemistry. And we will see how later that the Muslims actually developed that to create soap and to create shampoo in an era where people didn't have that. And to the extent that the British monarchy at that time used to order soap and shampoo from the Muslims in Andalus. Used to get it ordered, shipped over, soap and shampoo. A Zahrawi developed eye surgery and his findings are all going back to him because when it comes to eye surgery and optics, um, it's uncontested. Because some of these things, some of them say, well, no, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, Khawarizmi, it was somebody else. It wasn't uh, for Na Abbas ibn Farnas who did aviation, it was the Wright brothers. And, People will start, you know, trying to grab whatever they want. But Zahrawi is one of those people. When it comes to optics, nobody doubts. Even even Sina, what he did, and some of these people. So uh, Zahrawi, he was um, a leading person when it comes to optics, and he was talking about how the eye works and all those kind of things. And uh, he created uh, tools such as the scalpel and bone saws and forceps and fine scissors for his eye surgeries. So not only did he understand the eye very well, but he also knew how to operate on them. Ibn Nafis was the first to find blood circulation and a pattern, and how that pattern can become disrupted. How is that important today? One of the biggest things in our cultures is diabetes. People are dying because of that. Ibn Nafis was talking about how you can maintain your blood circulation and keep that pattern safe. That's medicine. Technology, calories, we looked at above because that's connected to mathematics, and like we said, screens and iPhones and all those things are you know, have to give thanks to his, uh, his findings. al Jazari used clocks and crankshafts to create the very first in engine, which they were then using for water cycles. So basically, I'm sure you know how a, 
how an engine works, but basically you have um, a clog at the bottom, and then that sits on there, and then it turns like that, and then maybe you need another clog, and that's your engine basically, and it moves like that. There's something that's giving it force, whether it's petrol or steam or something like that, and it keeps moving like that, and then that momentum creates a push. That's how your car works, that's how the water cycles work. al Jazeera was the first person to create that. So now if we look at the concept of clogs and crankshafts and, and creating an engine and creating valves and pistons and that kind of stuff, then robots today uh, and obviously machinery and, and, and transportation, all those things that which depend on that system, go back to what al Jazeera did with technology. Basim Fernas, we talked about before, created a model of aviation. He said, I can fly. So what he did, he went onto the Grand Mosque in Cordoba from Andalus, and he failed. He got wings, and I'm sure if you Google it, you'll find it. He got wings, and he actually fell. But what he did when he was falling, as you know, that the, the Muslims at that time, they used to wear a large cloak. As he was falling, he activated his cloak, and he used it as a parachute. Because he knew that that velocity in the air is going to keep him from falling down, you know, with velocity. So not only did he create advancements in aviation, but he also created the first parachute, but later on, he didn't fail, he flew for about 10 minutes. He actually flew for about 10 minutes. Ibn al-Haytham used lights and optics to create a camera, very similar to what uh, a Zahrawi did. Where does the word camera come from? Camera, camera. Camera, camera comes from camera. Why? Because he's saying that the lens can use light going in, borrowed light going in, to create vision and a reflection, and that reflection, that's how cameras work, I'm sure you're aware, through reflections. Where did he get reflection from? Well, Qamara Munira. Munir is a reflected and a borrow light from the Siraj, which is the sun. Purifying gunpowder and using potassium nitrate for military means, Muslims were using gunpowder and nitrate and all those kind of things to create, um, say weaponry, military means, what they used to do is they used to call it an egg-shaped ball. Uh, I think that other people call it something, something else. But an egg-shaped, an oval ball, and they used to propel it with great speed using gunpowder and potassium nitrate. And these, later on, and we can see now, is the same sort of concept that is used when we are looking at space travel because it uses the same gust of, of force to create a rocket to go up. Architecture, Muslims in Andalus, I'm very sorry, but it's nearly finished. Muslims in Andalus were tasked to develop Europe. So now when Andalus actually fell with the Christians, the Christians didn't say, well, you guys go away to your own Arab lands. We said, no, they overtook Andalus, but they said, we want you to stay. And even in Leicester, I've actually seen some buildings which have very um, Islamic kind of arches and there's actually a synagogue near where I live it's got actually it's, till this day it's got a dome and it's got like minaret kind of things with domes on the side of them and you find this in Italy you find this in Spain you find this absolutely everywhere within Europe where the Roman Empire saw growth after a period of you know being divided and they used Muslim architecture they were also attached to develop streets and, and canals and, and channels for providing services uh, and giving services to people in their homes. Culturally, the Muslims introduced the world to things that we take for granted today. Muslims had a way of insulating textiles. So you'd have a sheet of cotton. How can you make that cotton thicker? So now we, we take it for granted. So, but what they did is they started layering up different fabrics and creating thicker uh, clothing. So from private areas for personal hygiene and grooming, using vapor and hydroxide to develop perfume and even introduce the British monarchy we talked about that before so they were using that on a daily basis when certain cultures didn't have that and we, we take it for granted now but they the Muslims at that time took it for granted finance and banking vouchers and checks and banks were introduced as early as I believe about 100 to 200 after the Hijrah of the Prophet vouchers food stamps, welfare system. That was all at the time of the Prophet anyway. But we're just talking about transactions where you're not carrying around large coins of gold and silver and you know, large you know, quantities of money. You are actually banking them and you are replacing them with IOUs or vouchers or checks. Games and competitions 
were very important within certain uh, social settings. Uh, they used to have contests and chess and things like that. And tea houses and coffee houses were, you know, were quite common in in east, southern, or southeast Africa. That then got transported into Arabia, and they used to call it kahwa. Then it got moved over to Turkey, the, the, the middle region, and until to today, they can't say ha very well, they say va. So they didn't say kahwa, they said kahva. Kahva became coffee. And this was a very early Islamic point. Therefore, we can say, like we said before, Islam, we're not trying to create a divide. We're not saying that the Prophet was a science prophet, prophet of science, or this is a book which is talking about many scientific miracles. That's not our claim, and that was never going to be our claim. And it was never the Prophet Wasallam's claim. The Prophet Wasallam told us to believe in the unseen, and you have to have that belief. And it makes more logical sense than what anybody else says, because that we've already established, science in itself has a belief system also. So which one makes more sense to you? That's up to you to decide. But we will say the evidence on this side is much more compelling. And the way we know that is because of the actions and the manners that it promotes. And the goodness that it will create for society. And you would admit that yourself. Any other religion would admit that themselves. That you could have a set of fundamentals. You think, okay, on paper this looks really good. But if you go out and put it in, in public, does it actually work? That's a separate issue. Islam, for 1440 years, has said that, no, this is Correct. This is factual and this is why you have been created and this is what's going to make you a good human being. And your houses, and your families, and your communities, and your societies. And it's been proven. And it's not changed. Therefore, we have to say that this is the religion. This is the objectiveness that Islam has come about with. And we know that it is correct because of its impact on human development. It doesn't say that we are anti-science and we are anti-development. As we have seen, all of these things are still... Uh, we are indebted to today, we take a lot of these things for granted, and science has developed itself because of these findings itself. But like we've said, there is a realm for one thing and a realm for another. And if you're going to say that science becomes your benchmark, then eventually you will fall into having some kind of faith system anyway. So then you have to choose. Ask a lot to me, it's beneficial for us. I hope, I'm sorry it's been very long, and I hope it's been... Uh, beneficial for you and I ask Allah to give us firmness until we meet him. Yes, you can. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll share that around. I'll, uh, it's already on. Uh, I've got a blog. If you type in Ahlul, not Ahlul Shirk, stuff like that. That is genuinely a typo. Um, Ahlul Dhikr, this is the website, and it's, it, it should be, it will be on there, there it is. And the yes, yesterday's presentation is on here, and uh, we, we uh, try and put stuff on here regularly anyway, so. We'll post the link in the group chat, inshallah. Inshallah. Yusuf. I wanted to ask, um, you said Islam produced uh, games like chess. Yes. Uh, is chess not haram? Yeah, I mean, we're not, talking about the, um, we're not talking about the validity of it as a religious opinion. I mean, some of the ulama have said chess is... majority of the ulama have said you can't play chess. The majority of the ulama have said you can't play chess. Some of the ulama have said it's makru, and some of the ulama have said it's haram. Now, what seems to be the correct opinion is that it's haram. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the concept of games and competitions and, and those things were not healthy within the Islamic... So we're not talking about chess in particular. I mean, in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, he used to have wrestling and, and racing and Umar used to encourage archery and swimming and those kind of things. So maybe chess was a bad example, but we're talking about the influence on Western society today. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, what about the main arguments that you have when you say that the Prophet said that God is not the same? What are the main arguments when it comes to atheism? I mean, like, like I said, I think atheism is a whole different 
topic and we'd have to tackle that in a different way because you see the thing is what we're talking about here is what is Islam and is Islam backwards and is Islam anti-science, is Islam anti-development and that's what the purpose of this lecture was is that no it's not and it's not fair for you to compare it in that manner because Islam is one thing and science is another even according to both sides of the, of the argument, of the definition but having said that, Islam is actually pro-advancement and, and we've proven that also but when it comes to atheism, I mean some of the scholars have said that um, you have to look to be honest, I mean I don't think there is a set way of debating with somebody or arguing or, or discussing religion the religion of Islam with somebody. I think you have to look at the scenario that is surrounding certain people. Like for example, I'll give you an example. There was once a woman at work and she said, I don't believe in anything. And she was just a normal person. She's not like, I think she's just been influenced by people in the pub or people in her, in her, in her life. So then I just genuinely asked her, I said, okay, well, how, how do you think we got here? Coincidence. Okay, coincidence. But, I mean, your life is far too systematic for it to be coincidence. It doesn't make sense that it's coincidence. Well, it makes sense to me, I think, as long as you live a good life and you're a good person and you die a peaceful death, I mean, you've had a good life. That's how a lot of people think. So all I asked was, okay, well, if you think that evolution is coincidence, so then how do you think we got here? Coincidence, evolution, we start talking about that. And then I, asked, then, then I asked her, okay, then, well, when it comes to evolution, why have we stopped evolving? Why have we not got two heads or even ten heads? Why have we not got you know, multiple limbs and all those kind of things? Why, in actual fact, are we regressing? You know, people are worried about global warming. People are worried about certain diseases that didn't occur. People are talking about different things that are happening to the human body that shouldn't be happening and haven't happened ever. So, in actual fact, we are not evolving. And the evolution process actually stopped. And what has stopped that? She didn't know. And she said, well, I don't want to have this, this discussion with you anymore because it's, quite frankly, making me upset. So I said, oh, so if, that's your, if that's your wish, I don't want to upset you. I genuinely don't want to upset you. But the only reason why I ask this question, and this is what happens, unfortunately, to a lot of people. And they become emotional, whether they become aggressive or whether they become you know, uh, mundane or, or saddened or something. By So my point here is that you really have to look at the approach that the person um, is setting out. But what I will say is that Islam has a series of ways of establishing the existence of Allah. And the ulama have said that there are five. Number one, we have textual proof to know that Allah exists. And like we've said, that text that we have doesn't contradict itself ever. And if you were to implement that text that Allah has given us, you will have a good life. Therefore, you know that it's from Allah. That's one way of knowing that Allah exists. Another way of knowing that Allah exists is by looking at the universe. We've talked a bit about that. Looking at the universe... If that universe is correct, then there has to be a law that he has given to me which is correct. Another way of knowing that Allah exists, just because you can't see something doesn't mean that it's not there. Can you see oxygen? Can you see love? Can you see fear? But you can sense these things. Therefore, we can sense that there is a God. You can. There are moments in your life where you genuinely can. And another way that the ulama, with the fourth way, the fifth way, the ulama have uh, established the belief in God within Islam is that there is a, a connection between you and your worship. I'm sure, I speak for myself, I'm sure every single one of us here and every single one of us in the world, Muslim or not, has at one point called out to God and God has given to them what they wanted. I'm sure. And the Qur'an is full of that. Nuh alayhi salam lifted his hands up and he said, Oh Allah, I've been calling my people for 950 years, make this stop. What did Allah do instantaneously? The sun, sorry, the, the, the sky started raining and the earth started bringing out springs. Scientifically, this is proven that there was a great flood. Scientifically, there are tracks going back to a huge ark that existed in that same region that the Quran is talking about. This is my point here. Science, the things that we need to know about the unseen, there will be something in the scene which establishes that belief in the unseen. It's not that Allah is telling you, believe in this thing, whether you like it or not. No, Allah has given you an indication that that thing in the unseen is real. You're not going to understand it. There's no point in Allah trying to explain it to you because there is no ruling for you to be connected to it. So what if you know Jannah is such and such and it has such and such measurement? You can't see, you're not living in there right now and you are not going to act in Jannah whilst you're in the dunya. So there's no point. There's any point. 
The point there is, though, is Allah telling you that there is going to be a resurrection. There is going to be a recompense, so work towards it. How do you know? He gives you signs that it exists. So these are some of the ways that the ulama have talked about in knowing that Allah exists. And then what you would do is, looking at the person that you are speaking to, develop either one of those. Like for example, there was another person who recently said that she doesn't believe in God because the presence of evil. Had God been real and merciful and just and all those things that we believe in God typically to be, then why would he create Iblis? That makes me believe that God does not exist. Just because you can't work out the equation doesn't mean mathematics doesn't exist. It's the same thing, the same principle. But in actual fact, there's a contradiction. You're not believing in the unseen which is good, you should prefer to believe in the unseen which is bad. And you are affirming what is bad. Not only that, Allah creates bad and allows bad to happen as a test and a consequence from our own actions. If somebody was going to hit you in the face, Allah preserve you, what would you do? Say, oh, Allah willed it for me and can't really do anything. No, you would put blame on that person. And he said, I've got a mark on my face because of the consequence of your actions, not because of Allah. You wouldn't blame Allah because somebody hit you. And it's the same sort of thing. Why does Allah allow it to happen? Because, because, the first was here. I can't find it right now. But the reason why it happens is because Allah doesn't, and this is a misconception that this woman was having, is that how is God just if there is so much corruption on earth? Muhammad al Thaymeen said, the reason why a person is asking this question is because they are, they've got the wrong understanding of number one, what we were talking about. That there is a creator outside, he has certain names and attributes and actions which are befitting to him. She doesn't understood the actions and the names and attributes part. So she's only said that God is love and mercy and peace. But she's not also understood that he's also just and he's wise and he allows things to happen. Therefore, anything that happens in the creation doesn't happen because of love. People are being tormented in Burma and China and all these different places. Where is the mercy? Where is the just Lord that you believe in? We will say no. This is happening because there is a wisdom behind it. There's actually a mercy behind it and there's a justice and there is going to be some goodness that comes out of it. Whether we understand it or not. Sorry about the lengthy answer, but I think I genuinely don't believe that there is uh, a one...